You know, before we get started, uh, we're so blessed. You know, we've got so many wonderful uh, brothers and sisters here at the barn who serve and minister and just give of their time and their talents. And uh, one brother who's been here at the church many years, he's been on staff for about five years now, is, is Frank. Where is Frank? Come on up here, Frank. He has just been a, a dear, dear brother and just a, a great friend and a, a true servant here at the barn. He's been involved in so many different areas of service here, uh, different aspects of the ministry, and his fingers have been involved in just about every piece of the pie here. And so uh, over the years, we've just seen God working in his life and the heart that God's given him, the heart of a servant. And just the, the pastor's heart to love us and to take care of us. And, and you know, I like what Pastor Chuck used to say. He said that uh, man appoints, but God anoints. And we've seen God's anointing in Frank's life now for quite a while. And so we just wanted to gather together to confirm the anointing of God in his life uh, just by praying for him and... Uh, recognizing the, the pastor's heart that God has given Frank. And so we're just going to pray for Pastor Frank. And uh, today, uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Thank you, Pastor. Love you, brother. Thank you. And it's very appropriate today being Yom Kippur. <laughs> so we needed a sacrifice, so... Uh, <laughs> So let's just lay our hands on our brother and uh, just pray for him. Father, we're so thankful for our friend, our brother, your servant, Frank. Lord, we're just thankful for the heart you've given him, just that uh, heart of a pastor, Lord, just to love us, to help us, to serve us, to minister to each and every need that comes up. So Lord, we recognize the calling you've put in his life, Lord. We realize the anointing that you've given him. And so today we recognize the work that, Father, you have been accomplishing in Frank's life here at the barn. And, Lord, we just uh, do that by recognizing him as just a pastor, a shepherd, a heart of one who serves and ministers to the needs of others. So today, Lord, we recognize that and we acknowledge that before you, before family and friends. And we pray your blessing continually be upon him. Continue to fill him with your spirit, Lord. Continue to lead, guide, and direct him by your spirit to accomplish your plan and your purpose here at your church. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 God bless you, Frank. All right. God bless you, Frank. Father, Father Frank, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, let's open our Bibles to Psalm chapter 58, shall we? Psalm chapter 58. Now, the 58th Psalm is an imprecatory prayer. It's a prayer by David asking God to exact harsh and swift justice on unjust and wicked judges. Because in ancient times, oftentimes, the judges and the rulers... Uh, they had very little oversight. So they came to have absolute authority because they had very little um, accountability, if you will. And so they became very corrupt. They became unjust and subsequently acted wickedly. And so Psalm 58, David deals with these wicked judges. And uh, we're going to look at three things in chapter 58 about the wicked. Number one, the first thing involves the charges against the wicked. That's in verses 1 through 5, the charges against the wicked. In verse 1 of Psalm 58, David said, Do you indeed speak righteousness, you silent ones? Do you judge uprightly, you sons of men? No, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh out the violence of your hands in the earth. Now, these wicked judges were silent when they should have been speaking righteousness. They judged in partiality when they should have been judging in righteousness or in uprightness, we would say. 
And unfortunately, it's very sad that, uh, well, some things haven't changed. Uh, Unfortunately, we have seen a lot of judges today legislating from the bench rather than simply applying the law as it's written. So in uh, 3,000 years, well, things haven't really changed a whole lot. Verse 3, these charges continue. It says the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf cobra that stops its ears. (laughs) I didn't know snakes had ears. Uh, Which will not heed the voice of the charmers. Charming ever so skillfully. So here are the various charges brought against the wicked. They're very simple. They're very straightforward. However, in verses 3 through 5, David by default, if you will, uh, points to the depravity of mankind as a whole. It points to the fact that, well, we're born into sin. Now, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. In fact, we saw back in the 51st first psalm in Psalm 51 5 David said he was brought forth in iniquity and in sin he was conceived in his mother's womb again Paul picks up on this idea in Romans three twenty three. he says we all sin we all fall short of the glory of God and so since mankind as a whole is born into sin speaking of the depravity of man it puts us in a state of hopelessness if it were not for Jesus Christ. (laughs) Because apart from Jesus Christ, we are hopeless. But the good news is in, through, and because of Jesus Christ, we can have all of our unrighteousness removed and have His righteousness credited to our account. In fact, the Bible says that in 1 John 1, 9, all we have to do is confess our sin. And then He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And now, since we're an empty vessel, we can receive the righteousness of Christ, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where it says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So in, through, and because of Jesus Christ, our depravity is no longer there. We're no longer bound to sin. Sin no longer has authority or dominion over us. That's what Paul said in Romans 6.14. He said sin no longer has dominion over us. So we're no longer being controlled by our sin nature. Now, Obviously, that doesn't mean we're perfect. Uh, We're still going to sin. We're still going to fall short. We're still going to mess up. But we have now the Spirit of God living, dwelling, residing inside of us to enable us and empower us to turn from sin, to say no to sin. And I say praise the Lord to that. So number one, David deals with the charges against the wicked. Number two, the second thing involves judgment on the wicked. Judgment on the wicked. Look at verses 6 through 8. David said in Psalm 58, 6, he says, Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. <laughs> I like David. <laughs> Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. Let them flow away as waters which run continually. When he bends his bow, let his arrow be as if it's cut in pieces. Let them be like a snail which melts away as it goes, like a stillborn child of a woman, that they may not see the sun. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, it's how you really feel, David. Uh, Don't hold back. Here he's dealing with the judgment on the wicked. And David, of course, is calling for judgment on the wicked because he realizes that the wicked will not repent. They will not get right with God. And that probably is the idea that David's trying to convey to us, that the wicked judges, well, they haven't repented so far, so chances are they're not going to repent now. And as a result of that, God will exact judgment 
on these wicked judges. And the same is true for me and you. Look, when we don't repent, when we don't get right with God, man, (laughs) there's going to be judgment because God is a just God. He's a fair and equitable God. Oh, sure, He gives us plenty of time to repent, but if we don't, there could come a point in our lives where we turn our back on God for so long, God says, okay, fine, if that's how you want it, that's how you get it. In fact, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. So apparently, there could come a point in time where we turn our back on God for so long that that's what's going to happen. And it's going to continue to be that way. And that possibly carries that idea here in this imprecatory kind of prayer. So we've looked at the charges against the wicked and the judgment on the wicked. Now, number three, and finally, let's take a look at the destruction of the wicked. Uh, That's in verses 9 through 11, the destruction of the wicked. In Psalm 58, 9, David said, before your pots can feel the burning thorns, in other words, you know, these thorns are dry, they burn very quickly and very hot, and they heat up a pan very swiftly. But before these pots can even come to a boil because of these burning thorns, He, God, shall take them away as with a whirlwind, as in His living and burning wrath. The righteous shall rejoice when He sees the vengeance. He shall wash His feet in the blood of the wicked. In other words, their destruction will come. So, verse 11, that men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely He is God who judges in the earth. The destruction of the wicked will come swift and it will be sure. There's no doubt about that. So for you and me today, uh, the application becomes pretty important and pretty powerful. Because when we see the wicked prosper today, and many wicked are prospering, you know that as well as I do, when we see the wicked prosper, we have a tendency to get a little upset. We get a little bent out of shape. Okay, we get flat out angry. But there's no reason for it. Look, God's going to take care of that. He's going to judge the wicked. You say, okay, Clark, when's he going to do it? Well, I don't know. I'm not sure. But it'll happen in his time and in his way. So you and I don't have to worry about it. We don't have to fret regarding it because payday one day and according to verse 11 you and I because we have the righteousness of Christ credited to our account we have a great reward that lies ahead speaking of heaven so don't lose heart well uh, this brings us to Psalm 59 now Psalm 59 is a prayer for deliverance Uh, In 1 Samuel chapter 19, before David became king, Saul, the king of Israel, was uh, very upset that David was rising in popularity with the people. In fact, they were singing songs about Saul and David. They said Saul had killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And the people were really falling in love with David. So Saul in 1 Samuel 19 sent men to kill David at his house. They were watching his house. But David's wife, Michal, let him down through a window and he escaped safely. So this psalm, Psalm 59, is a psalm of deliverance when David was delivered from the hand of his enemy. And we've divided Psalm 59 into two very simple sections in dealing with deliverance. The first section is a prayer for deliverance. A prayer for deliverance. That's in verses one through 15. In Psalm 59, 1, David said, deliver me from my enemies. Oh my God, defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from the bloodthirsty men. For look, they lie in wait for my life. The mighty gather against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. 
They run and prepare themselves through no fault of mine. Awake to help me and behold. Now, as we mentioned in Psalm 119, David was being pursued. Saul, these mighty men were waiting outside of the house to kill him for no reason at all. It was no fault of his own. And yet he was being attacked, he was being persecuted, and he was being sought after. Boy, does anybody understand what David's going through. Yeah, sometimes we <laughs> have the same thing happens in our lives. Sometimes it happens at work with our co-workers, uh, sometimes in the neighborhood, and sometimes with family members where they come against us and attack us for no fault of our own. But note carefully that David turns to the Lord and he prayed that the Lord would deliver him. Now, no matter what we're going through or dealing with as it pertains to the enemies in our lives, it's always best to let God deliver us from their hands. Now, God will allow us to try to deliver ourselves, and oftentimes we try to do that, and it rarely works out very well. Uh, it's always best to step back and allow God to deliver us, as David sets that example here. Well, he goes on in verse 5, dealing with this prayer for God's deliverance. In verse 5, he says, You therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Do not be merciful to the wicked transgressors. I like this. David says, Lord, you punish my enemies. Lord, you deal with my enemies. Lord, you take care of my enemies. Lord, I'm putting this in your hands. Look, this is a good place to be. Just in the hands of God, allowing Him to deal with the situations and circumstances that are in our hearts and in our lives, specifically as it deals to those who are coming against us for no reason at all. Because typically, we want to vindicate ourselves to those who are coming against us. Because after all, we're right and they're wrong. Amen? And I know I'm right because if I were wrong, I'd change my mind. So clearly, they need to be dealt with. Now the problem is I want to deal with them. We always want our pound of flesh. We want to get even. We want revenge. But David is stepping back. He's saying, Lord, you take care of it. You deal with it. I'm going to put this in your hands. You know, Paul tells us to do the same thing, by the way, in Romans 12, 19. He said, my dear brothers, do not vindicate yourself one to another, but give place to wrath, for vengeance is mine. I will repay, thus saith the Lord. Well, verse 6, this section goes on. He says, at evening, they return, they growl like a dog and go all around the city. Indeed, they belch out with their mouth. Swords are in their lips. In other words, they're saying all kinds of crazy stuff. For they say, who hears? In other words, they want everybody to hear these lies and, and false words coming out of their mouth. But, verse 8, you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in derision or in scorn. O you, his strength, I will wait for you. For God is my defense. My merciful God shall come to meet me. God shall let me see my desire on my enemies. Do not slay them, lest my people forget. Scatter them by your power and let and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. In other words, don't kill them, Lord, but keep them alive. Scatter them so we'll never forget not to act like them. Well, verse 12. It says, for the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride. And for the cursing and lying which they speak, consume them in wrath, consume them, that they may not be. And let them know that God rules in Jacob or in Israel to the ends of the earth. And at evening... They return, they growl like a dog and go all around the city. They wander up and down for food and howl if they are not satisfied. Now here, David once again 
is desiring for God to take his enemies and not necessarily kill them or utterly destroy them, but to scatter them so that not only Israel, but all the earth will know that God's in charge, that God is ruling, verse 13, over Jacob and to the ends of the earth. And boy, what an encouragement that should be for all of us. Because no matter what we are going through, no matter what we are dealing with, if we're a child of God, God's on the throne. He is ruling over all the earth. Now, I understand that the earth has been given to Satan. He has the title deed of the earth at this point, if you will. It was forfeited by Adam and Eve back in the book of Genesis. And I love that old hymn we sing, This is my Father's world. Um, You know, this is my Father's world. Well, I love this song, but it's not right. It really belongs to Satan. And I think we see the ravages of sin in the world today. However, ultimately, God's even in charge of that. So for you and for me, no matter what we're going through or dealing with, and I realize that sometimes we go through some very difficult situations. We go through some... really hard times. But God is on the throne and God allows it to happen or he's made it happen for a reason why I don't know. For what purpose, I'm not sure. But I do know that God is ruling over all of Jacob and to the ends of the earth and he's ruling over our lives as well. Ephesians 1.11 says that God is orchestrating all things according to the counsel of his will. And that should bring great comfort to our hearts, to be sure. Prayer for God's deliverance. Well, let's come to the second and final thing in Psalm 59, and that involves praise for God's deliverance. In verses 16 and 17. In Psalm chapter 59, verses 16 and 17, we have praise for God's deliverance. Notice what David said in verse 16. He says, but I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning, for you have been my defense, a refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O my strength, I will sing praises, for God is my defense, the God of my mercy. Man, what an incredible Psalm. Here David is experiencing, well, an incredibly difficult time in his life. They're out to kill him. He's on the run. He prays for God to deliver him, and God does. And now he praises God for his deliverance because he recognizes that God is his strength, that God is his defense, and God is his refuge. As a result of that, listen gang, as a result of that, he's able to praise the Lord. Sometimes we have a tendency to get our eyes off of Jesus and onto our circumstances. We go through some difficult times and we have to deal with it. I get it. I'm not saying we put our head in the sand and do nothing. That's not what we're talking about. But we get so focused on what's going on in our lives that we lose lose sight of the fact that God's on the throne and He's ruling over everything. And when we truly begin to get that in our own hearts and in our own lives, now all of a sudden, yes, there's there's difficulty. I'm not trying to minimize that. But at the same time, we understand that God's our strength, God's our refuge, God's our defense. And as a result of that, we can end up praising the Lord. Praising Him for His mercy and His goodness and His long arm of comfort that comforts us in our time of need. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1.3 that He is the God of all comfort and the God of all mercy who comforts us in our time of tribulation. And when we begin to grab a hold of that simple fact by keeping our eyes on Jesus, 
not looking at the things of the world as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4.18. He says, do not look at the things that are seen, but rather look at the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. And when we keep that perspective, man, the byproduct of that is we'll praise the Lord. Well, let's come to the next psalm, Psalm chapter 60. Now, the 60th psalm is a psalm of teaching, if you will, as David laments over various setbacks and losses, specifically in the battle recorded in 1 Chronicles 18 and 2 Samuel chapter 8. Yes, he laments the, the loss in the battle, but ultimately God brings a victory and God brings deliverance. And boy, what a parallel, parallel that is for our life. Because, you know, in our own lives, we have setbacks. <laughs> we have losses in the battles that we fight on a daily basis. But we don't lose heart. Because God brings the victory. He ultimately will bring the deliverance. You say, okay, Clark, when's, when's the victory going to come? I don't know. I'm not sure. It might come in this lifetime. But the ultimate victory will come when we, when we die. <laughs> That's when we're really going to be victorious and we're ultimately going to be delivered for, from each and every hardship that we're dealing with. And boy, what a, a beautiful psalm this is dealing with deliverance. Now, this second song that deals with deliverance, we'd mentioned three things about it. It's very similar to the previous psalm. The first part of this psalm deals with a prayer for deliverance, a prayer for deliverance. Look at verses 1 through 5. In Psalm chapter 60, verse 1, David said, O oh God, you have cast us off. You had broken us down. You have been displeased. O oh, restore us again. You have made the earth tremble. You have broken it. Heal its branches, for it is shaken. You have shown your people hard things. You have made us drink the wine of confusion. You have given a banner to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth, that your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. Now, this psalm begins in a very beautiful way by David acknowledging the fact that, well, he and Israel messed up. Lord, we've messed up. What we've done, verse 1, has displeased you. Therefore, we deserve what you have dished out, we might say in our modern day vernacular. But Lord, now hear me, restore me, deliver me, save me. So it's a beautiful beginning regarding this prayer of deliverance. And I believe this is where God wants all of us to be. I believe he wants all of us to be in this place of humility saying, God, what I have done displeases you. And I am willing to accept the consequences of my actions. So sock it to me. But Lord, when you do, I pray for restoration, deliverance, salvation, we might say. Now, one problem we often face is when we do something wrong, we confess, we repent, we stop doing it, and praise God, we should. But when we stop sinning and we confess and repent of it, we think that there shouldn't be any consequences. Like somehow, well, God, I, I said I was sorry. I confess my sin. So don't punish me for it. I think we all know better than that. There's always consequences to our actions. Galatians 6, 7 says we're going to reap what we sow. And when we're okay with that, when we finally come to that place of absolute humility like David did saying, Lord, I know I've displeased you and I'm willing to accept the consequences to my actions, but have mercy on me. I believe that's exactly where God wants all of us. So that deals with the prayer for deliverance. Now, the second part of this psalm deals with assurance of deliverance. Assurance of deliverance. Look at verses 6 through 8. In Psalm chapter 60, verse 6, David said, God has spoken, 
in His holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and measure out the valley of Sokoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is the helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Speaking of the assurance of deliverance of the various cities there in Israel. And then in verse 8, he says, Moab, which of course is across the Dead Sea on the east side of the Jordan, is my wash pot. Over Edom, I will cast my shoe. Now, Edom and Moab is, of course, where the Moabites and the Edomites, the enemies of Israel were. So they're going to be their wash pots and where they cast their shoes. Philistia, the area of Israel, shout in triumph because of me. Now here in verses 6 through 8, David has full belief that the Lord will deliver Israel from the hand of these pagan nations. He has absolute assurance of God's deliverance of the nation of Israel. And he has absolute assurance and totally believes that the Lord will deliver him from his enemies. And boy, these are two very important truths. Because as we look around the world today, we see, well, it's circling the drain. Hey, the world's spinning out of control. What used to be right is now wrong. What used to be bad is now good. Everything is upside down. And it's not getting better. Boy, isn't this an encouraging message. But that's okay because I have absolute faith and I totally believe that God knows what He's doing. And one great, grand, and glorious day, He's going to turn it all around. Now, it might be in this lifetime. It might not. I don't know. I don't care. But I have absolute assurance of deliverance as it pertains to the world as a whole. But the second aspect of that great truth is the same can be said for our lives. Hey, look, sometimes our lives, we feel like we're circling the drain. (laughs) We feel like we're at the end of our rope. Like, man, I I just can't, I I can't take any more God. Hello? Okay, three of us. Okay. But know this, we have absolute assurance of deliverance. We have absolute faith in Jesus Christ that He's going to get us to cross over to the other side. And there will be victory. Well, number three and finally, the third and final aspect of this song involves confidence regarding deliverance. Confidence regarding deliverance. Uh, That's in verses 9 through 12. Take a look. In Psalm chapter 60, verse 9, it says, Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, O God, who cast us off? And you, O God, who did not go out with our enemies? Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. Through God we will do valiantly, for it is He who shall tread down our enemies. The Lord brought about defeat. Verse 10, He cast them down, and it's the Lord who's going to tread down the enemy as well. Because the help of man is virtually useless, but the help of God is priceless. And here David makes that incredible truth by stating his confidence that God will deliver him, that God will vindicate him, and God will deal with his enemies. And I guess this confidence regarding deliverance carries the idea that he recognizes that God is always with him. Question, was David going through a difficult time? Oh yes, absolutely. Was he experiencing great trial and great tribulation? You betcha. But he had absolute confidence in God's deliverance because he had confidence in God's presence, we might say. And what's true for David is equally true for us. You know, when we're going through difficult times, it's always good to have friends, family, and loved ones, and the body of Christ with us. And that's a glorious thing, to be sure. But we need to remember that God's always with us, no matter where we're at, no matter what we're dealing with or going through. In fact, according to Hebrews chapter 13, in verse 5, God said, I will never leave you 
I will never forsake you. He's always with us. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, Lo, I am with you most of the time. Oh, no, excuse me, he didn't say that. He said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Boy, that's the confidence regarding deliverance. Well, real quickly, let's finish up with Psalm 61. It's a rather short psalm, only eight verses. Psalm 61 is a psalm of assurance, probably written when David had fled from Jerusalem after the rebellion of his son Absalom in 2 Samuel chapters 15 through 18. He was living on the east bank. He was on the other side of the Jordan. And here in Psalm 61, David points out how a godly man should respond to great trials and tribulation in his life. And we would mention three things. Number one, the first thing involves direction from God. Direction from God. Look at verses 1 and 2. A very familiar psalm, Psalm 61, 1. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Man, David's heart was overwhelmed. His son Absalom rebelled against him. He had to flee Jerusalem for his very life. He's living on the east side of the Jordan. His heart is overwhelmed. And he prays for direction. Direction from God. Lord, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. Lord, lead me, guide me, direct me to a solid foundation, to a, a firm foothold, we might say. And this is a great thing to do. Because when we deal with people who are going through a difficult time and their heart is overwhelmed, we need to make sure we lead them to the rock. <laughs> Lead them to Jesus, not to ourselves. Because we love to play the hero. We love to play the big shot. Hey, come over here. Let me help you. No, we need to point them to Jesus Christ. He's the rock. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, the Bible says that Jesus is that rock. And what a beautiful prayer. Direction from God. Number two. The second thing involves the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God. And look at verses 3 through 7. In Psalm 61, 3, David said, For you have been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. You will prolong the king's life, his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve or keep or guard him. So David recounts the faithfulness of God in his life because God was his shelter his strong tower, his vow hearer. God was his all and all. Speaking of the faithfulness of God. Now, it's interesting because in verse 4, he said, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. Now, David is on the east side of the Jordan. He's far away from the tabernacle or the temple of God, we might say, the tent of meeting at that point in time. So at this point in time, the tent of meeting or the tabernacle where the Ark of the Covenant, where the children of Israel came to worship was nowhere near David. And yet David said, I'm going to dwell in your tabernacle forever. Which no doubt points to and speaks of the faithfulness of God. He absolutely knew that God was going to be faithful to bring him back to the tabernacle so he can continue to worship God. Now, I think by way of application, it points to and speaks of the faithfulness of God in our life. Why? Well, because just as David desired to abide in the tabernacle of God, we desire to abide in Christ. Now, for you and I, abiding in Christ isn't about a place. 
Don't get me wrong. I think it's wonderful that we have a place we can come together. It's beautiful that the body of Christ, there's something sweet and something very special about us getting together and fellowshipping one with another and praying for each other and, and worshiping the Lord together through song and the study of the Word. And it's, it's, it's glorious. Don't misunderstand. But abiding in Christ, it isn't about a place. It's about the condition of our heart because that's where Christ dwells, in our heart. And He's going to be faithful to continually dwell in our heart long as we're abiding in Christ, we might say. Read John chapter 15. It speaks of our faith in Christ knowing that He'll be faithful to remain and abide in us. Now there's one thing we should mention about the faithfulness of God. (laughs) And that is, He is faithful even when we or not. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but sometimes we're a little faithless. Well, not us, but you know, people at other churches. We drop the ball. We mess up. We fall short. But you know, God never does. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13.8 tells us. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2.13, the Bible says that He is faithful. If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. So the faithfulness of God. Well, let's come to the third and final thing, and we'll wrap this up right here. We've looked at direction from God, the faithfulness of God. Now, the third and final section involves praises for God praises for God. Look at verse 8. He says, so I will sing praise to your name forever that I may daily perform my vows. And I guess the point of Psalm 61 is pretty powerful. When we receive direction from God and see the faithfulness of God, it's going to result in praises to God. No matter what we're going through or dealing with, we recognize, man, God has set us on a a rock, on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. And He's going to continue to be faithful regardless of our situations. And the byproduct of that is going to be praising the Lord. Father, we thank You for these very simple but very powerful and important lessons in Your Word. Lord, the Psalms, just so uh, practical so applicable to each and every one of our lives, no matter where we're at. And Lord, we know that uh, by Your great grace, by the power of Your Spirit, Lord, You will continue in each and every one of our lives to enable us and empower us, Lord, to have absolute dependence upon You, abiding in You, receiving mercy from you. That, Lord, our lips would sing praises to you. Let it be so all the days of our lives we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, be sure to come on up after service. The pastors, the brothers, the sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, and just to serve and minister to each and every need that you might have in your hearts and lives today. And I do pray that God would richly bless you, and that He would open the windows of heaven and just pour out His Spirit in a fresh and powerful way as you just feel God's love and God's presence and God's grace and mercy in your hearts and lives. So go forth in His love and in His Spirit. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a a great rest of the week in Jesus.